Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Red Lights mm-hmm. On says, we're working. What's happening, Fish and Friends? Welcome to another live. Looks like we're up and running here. Uh, Dizzle and I, we're getting some last second things ready. So I appreciate everybody jumping in here. Already got, just hit live. and We've already got 61 people watching. Y'all are daggum amazing supporters of the Debo crew. Always have to shout out all the subscribe Fish and Friends. Uh, and of course, uh, the members, just like Mr. Chris Russ with a, a big old musculange there. Appreciate all the members that continue to pay and support me on a, a monthly basis. I've I've talked to some people a couple times because I'm like, dude, I'm I'm behind on the lot on the uh, the members only. You know, I haven't done lives every Saturday. Get a little bit behind. I'm like, I'm gonna stop doing the members, and people are like, no, no, don't stop doing it. Don't. So listen, if y'all feel like you don't get uh, any benefit out of it, or I'm behind, by all means leave. Uh, but I appreciate the hell out of everyone who stays. So tonight. Little Saturday Night Live. Hawks just won. Go Hawks. It's a good Saturday. Grind out victory over uh, the Badgers up north. Dizzle, are you uh, are you excited about the sports balls? No. No? Oh, okay. Nope. Yeah. Just, uh, just, just checking to make sure. Um, so listen, tonight I was sitting thinking, like, what would be something fun we could do to try to go through some stuff to see, like, What's helpful to people? Because listen, there's a lot of crap on YouTube and social media. And it's like, I find myself getting frustrated with it because it's like, you see these people doing stupid crap, getting all kinds of views. And it's like, listen, I can't control that. You know, focus on what I can control and trying to have fun, but still keep it educational. So I, so I thought tonight we would do five fishing ways. Fishing license trivia. Fishing license trivia. Woo. Everybody loves it. <laughs> Um, five ways to improve at fishing. And these are five things that I've done. Dizzle and I have done. We talked a little bit about it today. We went out fishing. It was a daggum grind fest. Um, I saw more cool wildlife today. I was actually more into the wildlife watching than catching fish because it was so slow. Um, a bit of a grind fest, but we talked through some things that have helped us and we're going to be really focusing more on bass fishing. That's what we do mostly. It'll still get into other stuff, but just kind of take with a grain of salt. It will be kind of bass oriented. So what were you going to say there, Dizzle? Um, it kind of to go along with your wildlife photography session today. Um, we kind of, you know, did some backwoods trekking. Um, we went away from the norm. We, you know, hit the trails and kind of blazed our own path. Uh, Debo was a bigger man than I, and he jumped down like a 38 foot cliff and I'm like, eh, I'm going to double back and go around. Granted, it's uh, an extra, I don't know, 200 yards, but uh, I don't, I'm not jumping down a cliff. It was like an eight foot little embankment that I jumped <laughs> off of. And okay, that's what the anyway. old man needs. So, so when I double backed, the cool thing is, I think it's cool anyway. I just randomly happened upon a geocache in the middle of the woods on this little tiny island that normally would be either completely covered with water or very darn close to being covered in water. I just thought that was super cool. Um, I thought I had stumbled upon like, I don't know if you guys seen cocaine bear where the guy kicks all the drugs out of the plane. I figured I stumbled upon something like that. And then I took a, (laughs) took a second. Glad you didn't. It was a little wooden box. It was a puzzle box that I had to figure out. That took me the longest part about it. But yeah, side danger. Yeah, Dizzle Dizzle doing puzzle boxes. I was wildlife watching, saw a couple big old beavers today, uh, a family of otters eating all the fish. That's probably why I couldn't catch anything. Caught a snake, caught a couple cool looking frogs. So it was, you know, it was getting getting to be one with nature hanging out. But we're not here to talk about nature and the wildlife. We're here to talk about fishing. So Five ways to improve at fishing. These are five things that I like. I've really been thinking, like, what are some of the things that I have really, really done? And I want chat to weigh in here too. I should have had more stuff ready beforehand um, because just while Dizzle and I were talking, I was like, can I share like pictures and stuff? And I was checking and I can do windows and stuff. So I was sharing like, or I was going through and looking at like pictures to help aid this. So the first day, oh, real quick, I do want to, so uh, Ed was on with us last week, said got a second place finish in today's last tournament of the season. Congrats, uh, gone fishing with Ed. Give him a follow, Congrats. good dude. 
Congrats, my friend. I see, man, we got a bunch of people jumping in. Kuda over at Jig Squad. What's up, you handsome fella? Also, Mr. Paul Glass. Paul? Paul, have you uh, saved up enough money, money for those uh, special croc attachments I sent you? I, I sent him an Instagram of like some craziness. I had like headlights for your crocs and uh, all kinds of shenanigans. <laughs> Tackle Talk was in here. Don't know if they're still in. Tackle Talk keeping me awake on fishing road trips since, I don't know, 2020 or whenever I started listening to them, 2021. <laughs> Uh, man, some awesome people in here. Well, listen, uh, I appreciate everybody that jumps in to join us. I love all you guys and gals. Um, so the first thing I have, number one, I should have like done some cool uh, like clip art to it. Uh, and I actually tried doing some of it on my phone and it wouldn't save the images. Because like, I, so I finally got a new phone, finally after like, I don't know, four years. And this is the new Samsung. It's got a little, it's got a little pen stylus deal here. So I was like doing drawing and stuff and too fancy for my old ass, but number one is going to be casting angles. So what do I mean by casting angles? You hear a lot of like the pros talking about it. Like, well, you know, I pulled up to this point and had to get the right angle. Casting angles is something that I had to definitely get more into as I grew as an angler, because I was in the neighborhood of, you know, if I've thrown a couple casts at the place and I haven't caught a fish, they're not there. Right. So let's take, for example, this fishing jetty that I've got up here. As I walk out to fishing jetties, um, and most people probably do this. You can kind of see Dizzle's legs out there and there's a, like a park bench, uh, way out there at the end. Uh, let's see, am I even, there we go. Can you see my cursor or no? Yep. Okay. So clear it here on the park bench by Dizzle's legs. As people walk out to these rocky fishing jetties, most people that I see walk out to the end, throw a couple lines out, fish that far end of it and call it quits. Walk back. So one thing that Dizzle and I talk about, and not all jetties, and this isn't just jetties, we're, we're, we're talking casting angles, but I'm using this as an example. Casting parallel to things. So whether I'm walking down the bank, whether I'm casting parallel to a rocky fishing jetty like this. So I'm throwing my cast way out here and bringing it parallel to this bank. Because what you're going to have in spots like this oftentimes is a drop off. When they make these, this is obviously a, a man-made um structure jetty. Yep. yep jetty when you walk out to it depending on the place and i should have taken pictures one of the pretty big lakes that we have around here they drained it um not all the way but they drained it to do like renovations and dredging and then doing like fish uh hides and all that crap um but anyway some of the spots that you went to so like let's say the fishing jetties right here even with like my head some of them they would come down really steep and it was like a you know six to ten foot drop off some of them, they actually had like stair stepped down, like a terraced hillside, like for farming, stair stepped out. So seeing some of those places um, drained and how they've, you know, how they make some of these is interesting. So the, the spot that we're at here is a spot that has probably, I would say, a six feet drop off, but it kind of gets larger even out to the end here, probably closer to eight foot as you go out. So as you very first start walking, like right here, it's pretty shallow, you know, a couple feet it's deep. It's like a big flat, almost like a spawning flat. Yeah. And as you get out more, it's like a downhill slope. And off this, the bank, you know, four, five, six feet out, it really hits the depth of that taper. So fishing parallel to these before you walk out to the end of the jetty, or if you get to the end of the jetty and there is, which is my second picture here, and I had it. Here we go. You walk out to the end of the jetty and there's a piece of cover. So like here, I was throwing a buzz bait at this um, brush pile. Don't just throw like one or two casts at it and say, nope, there's nothing there. I can actually walk all the way over here to the left where you see this other wood and stuff. I can walk over there and hit the backside of this brush. So for folks that just go to a spot and think that, well, you know, I threw a couple casts at the end of the jetty. Um, there was nothing there. Are you paralleling the sides of the jetty? Are you paralleling the bank that you walk up to? Are you hitting both sides of the brush, the back of the brush, the front of the brush, hitting all the different angles of that? Because it can it can literally make or break. I could cast to the front of that brush, not hit anything uh, or the the side of the jetty, nothing. But I go to the right side where it's windblown, let's say, or a windblown bank that I'm paralleling or the back side of the brush where all the baits blowing through and they're they're hitting it. Those are really the spots to, you know, try to find that and key in on that if you can. Not always, you know, sometimes there's fish there, sometimes there's not. But picking those spots apart um, 
as you can and hitting different angles from it, not just one or two casts to it. Uh, Debo, can you pull that picture back up? Uh, which one? Of uh, the jetty. Um, Wander. Mm-hmm. Yep. Jetty. So the other thing I kind of want to, to, you know, kind of reiterate or piggyback on Um so dealing with angles and things like that, the other thing you want to do is how Debo said, you know, the left side, it, it you know, tapers down a little bit more. Um, the right side traditionally is going to be, I'm trying to think here, the right side's more of the windblown side, right? Where the well, wind's it depends. Pushing yeah. in. So if you've got winds coming, like generally a spot when you fish it. So like what we're talking about here is you can see all the ripples are pushing into this side. So this is the windblown point. This is what we're talking about. So when you go out fishing, generally you want to try to have the wind in your face, like as a bank angler, specifically talking. If you're in a boat, you can position however you want. But as a bank angler, the wind's blowing into this side of it. You can see how all this is calm back here. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed it both ways. There's sometimes where they're all stacked up on the front over here, where the wind's all blowing to it. And there's sometimes you can see right where this wind kind of cuts past this. They'll sit right up in here in this slack where there's no wind, no current really. Everything's like kind of blowing past them. Yeah, they can ambush. Or sometimes they're over here in the real slack water. If it's really windy over here, sometimes mm-hmm. they're sitting over here and all this where it's slack. So try to pay try to pay attention to those when you hit those angles, the different spots, and try right. to replicate that on the lake. Like this lake, there's probably one, two, three, four, like five of these jetties. Mm-hmm. So you can replicate that and see, does it hold up? Every single one has been on the windblown side. Every right. single one's been on the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the slack side, trying to to use those and find um, some sort of pattern. So the other thing that I kind of wanted to touch on is also, you know, traditionally you were, if you have a jetty like this that is going north and south, the wind is going to traditionally blow east to west. You're not going to necessarily get a big northern wind or southern wind outside of like winter. Um, so the other thing is, knowing so this uh the left side is actually a little less weedy than what the right side is and that's something you kind of want to pay attention to as well if it's you know depending on where your jetty is in comparison to you know a cardinal direction um just make sure you're looking into the water and you're just not blindly casting um i've noticed personally on this jetty the left hand side has been way more productive um, so if you're looking at the left-hand side for, I would say 90% of the entire left-hand side is more productive on the right-hand side. I'm more productive on the very end, you know, the very end five to 10% is where I get the majority of the productivity just because of how the wind blows and, you know, cutting those angles off and things like that. Good points. And that's actually going to bring us into point two. I'm going to check chat here because I've kind of been ignoring it all. Um, let's Hella see. in the house. Hella in here? Mm-hmm. Um, fishing after dark said good for Milliken. Yeah, somebody showed, uh, I don't remember who it was, showed the thing that Milliken earned a spot in the elites in the classic, which is freaking crazy, dude. That's awesome. Good for him. Dude can definitely, dude can definitely fish. Um, let's see. People talking about some river fishing. Hickman Outdoors, Gramps in here. What's up, man? There's Hella. Doing some learning tonight, uh, you know, loose cuff learning. People are probably watching football and stuff, but for us nerds that like to hang out and talk fishing, we're going to try. Yeah, only 70 likes. There's 167 people. There better, better be 168 likes. Come mm-hmm. on, folks. Get going mm-hmm. here. It's free. If you like it, help a Debo out. Um, let's see. Okay. So that was pretty much all that was there for questions. Okay. So number two, that was a perfect segue into number two is, um, for me, <clears throat> unlocking different cover patterns and fish and friends out there. If you've got questions as we're going along, throw them out there, man. I want to try to grab these and interact with y'all as much as we can tonight, but finding different patterns and trying to replicate that. So kind of the same as it kind of ties into the other one. Um, you know, talking about jetties and different spots and trying to replicate that. Specifically, I want to talk about different types of cover. And I didn't get um, enough pictures of this brought up, darn it. But so let's say this spot. So as Randy was talking about on the left side of that jetty where there's more grass, 
grass lines, okay? Huge pattern during the summer into the early fall. Those good grass lines that are hard where you've got different spots that you can hit from the bank, you know, or from a boat, that, that's a piece of cover. It doesn't seem like it, but in those really grassy vegetation filled lakes, grass lines are a perfect spot for fish to sit, ambush, bait and stuff's going to cruise that looking for stuff to eat. And there you'll often see them just going in packs along those grass lines. So that is, I count it as a type of cover, grass lines, right? Um, wood. So, I mean, saying on my channel, fine wood, pitch to wood, brush piles like we have here. And I don't know if I can, you know, just a big old brush pile. Okay. You could have a big tree. So like down here, you can't really sit, but there's a big tree that's laying down on the other side of this. You've got rock piles. If you're in a boat out on, um, humps, you know, so a big rock pile that maybe everywhere is 12 feet of water. You've got a big rock hump that comes all the way up to five feet. Okay, that's a type of, and that's really actually technically structure because it's part of the lake, but um, we're going to call it cover. It could be docks, you know, northern guys going around and hitting all the different types of docks, right? Skipping docks, uh, marinas, you've got uh, rocky riprap banks, you know, it could be like a large boulder pile. It could be the spots where you find rock, anything like that, and really paying attention to that more uh, as you fish. Help me become a better angler for sure. How about you all out there? Yeah, kind of noticing those, especially if you have like a diving, like a, say like a square bill or something like that. I noticed today when we were out, the majority of the first lake that we were on, um, it was sandy. Tons and tons and tons of sand everywhere. But every once in a while, you would come across that, you know, more like pea gravel, bigger chunks, but still a sandy base overall. You know, a, a fish will probably relate to that because it's going to be a little bit warmer than just what the sand is, you know, with the rocks and, and hold the warmth a little bit more. So paying attention to your lure also as it's coming through. Um, I noticed a couple of times uh, we were talking at the second, wait, the very last lake that we went to. Um, we were fishing and we're like, man, there used to be a huge brush pile right here. And I was like, well, it wasn't actually a brush pile. It was a beaver den like an underwater beaver den and you know looking at it we we're like oh geez how didn't we realize this earlier now there's a giant beaver den up on the shore so you know they took what was there that you used to fish that you were used to getting hung up on and moved it <laughs> so it's no longer structured for the fish so that kind of sucks but yeah just being aware of you know what you're feeling and not just oh hucking and winding type of stuff Old Huckadoo. Yeah, I'm uh, going through. Sorry, I'm not ignoring you. Does I'm going through trying no, to get some of these. Um, Pat, dude, great question. That's that's one of the toughest things to not get spun out because I'll start to get in my own head when I can't get bites. Uh, but he said, how do I find a pattern when I can't get a bite? And there's dude, there's about 17 million different variables that you can attest to that. But yeah, sometimes I'll go out like today, cloudy, kind of drizzly, rainy. I thought for sure I was going to get on a spinnerbait bite. And I did catch a couple on a spinnerbait, but not the way I thought. And this is when I started talking, I'm like, because he fished the first spot that we went today and crushed him. Caught a whole crap ton the other day. And I said, was that before all the rain? Because we had multiple days of heavy rain. He said, yeah, it was before that. Well, crap, that probably killed it. Water was dirty, green, um, muddied up, cooled it down. Rain's going to cool stuff down. So you have to be willing to adapt. And the first spot we went, it just, it didn't kick off. We didn't catch a single thing there. Made a little mm -hmm. change. We each caught a couple of fish at the next spot, but yeah, I, I had full money in on, I was going to get on a spinnerbait bite today. I was going to catch pike. Didn't happen. How do you find a pattern when you can't get bit? I would say be willing to try as many different things as you can and don't get mm -hmm. stuck in one spot covering water. So cover water, try wood, try docks, try rock. Don't just go to spots because this is what I tend to do when I can't get a bite. I'll tend to go to spots where I've had luck in the past. And if I'm still not getting bites there, I'm like, F it. I'm going to go home, take a nap. They're not biting today. When really mm -hmm. you should focus on covering water. Because every time you go out there, it's different. You know, it's not going to be, oh, I always crush them on this point. And you go to that point, you don't catch them that time. Doesn't mean they're not biting. It could be somewhere else. Like I told Dizzle today. Um, and I'm not sure how I would have fished it, even from a boat. But I know in the past, this time of year, when you'll have rain and those storms come through, it'll often draw those fish out a little deeper. Mm -hmm. But it was so dirty. I don't even know how you would have caught them there. You know, I would have said jerk made out deeper, but it was so dirty green that 
I don't think um, he caught, caught him on a jerk bait, but I so, don't know. Great yeah. question, man. I, I did have at the first place before you showed up because I was there way before you even showed up. You were like almost two hours late to getting oh to Lake God, today, but man. we won't talk about that. Um, anyway, um, the second stop that we made, I I 100% got spun out there. Like I was like this windblown point. I'm going to throw a jig because it was huge chunk rock. <laughs> we'll how many jigs did I lose? I don't know, like four or five. I had four or five jigs in one spot I lost. And I was like, I was trying, I was trying to beat a dead horse. I was like, I know they're going to bite on a jig. I just have to keep throwing a jig. And I just got more and more and more frustrated with myself. And then he threw a tantrum was, and threw his ride and laid down on the, on the, uh, the jetty and was kicking his feet and banging his hands on the floor going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did that. That was dizzle. Pretty much. Shut up. Shut up. Um, Shan, Shan in the house too. Shan, how are you? Um, says I have observed bass like to push bait mm. into steep ledges, trapping them. Yeah, that's that's another thing that I didn't focus on enough. So, like being a, a power fisherman, dad and I, you know, would cruise around, fish the shallows, fish visual cover, lay downs, trees, that kind of stuff. Fish love to trap bait, and like the two things that I didn't pay enough attention to is fish will push bait straight up and ping, pin them against the top of the water because obviously they can't fly, they can't get out. They'll use the top of the water to push bait and they'll use vertical structure to push bait vertically. So like he's saying, uh, push bait into those steep ledges, trapping them, I guess. And this isn't necessarily tied to, to what Shan's saying, but trapping bait is it's easier for fish to hunt up and trap bait than it is to chase them all clear around, you know, whether they're on a flat, you know, maybe, but oftentimes pinning them up and that's when you'll see that schooling behavior or fish starting to pop and you'll see like the little minnows dump, jumping like dolphins trying to get away. Um, oftentimes a good sign to throw topwater fish are feeding up as opposed to I've thrown a jig all day and I always catch them on a jig here. I'm not catching anything. Those mm -hmm. fish not, might not be feeding down, looking down at jigs. You know, they might be actively feeding on bait looking up. So yeah, so that's the other thing that we kind of got. And that actually um, ties into number three that we talked about, Dizzle. We're segueing yeah. like pros tonight. Well, hold on before we we hop on that segue. Okay. Um, the other thing is Sorry. we we kind of again got spun out on this because we were constantly from the second that we showed up at the very well that you showed up at the very first lake, and I told you it was the exact same way when I showed up. There was stuff you could see bait getting pushed. Um, you could see, you know, fish breaking, you would, you know, giant blow ups on, on the top of the water. And we're like, holy, holy cow, we just have to find them and we're going to destroy them. And I know personally, I kind of got stuck in that pattern and I kind of threw the other stuff to the side and I wasn't necessarily willing to try something different because I was like, I know they're going to be eating on the top or near the surface. I just have to wait till I see a, a bait ball and That's then cast the key it right that. there you just and, said it yeah that was that was the other thing i was thinking about too is just like dizzle said i'm gonna i'll wait till i see a bait ball it can be really dangerous chasing bait because mm -hmm. they're there and is gone as quick as they showed up and they're moving it's not like as a bank angle you can just wait there and they're gonna come back they were all over they were out towards the middle of the lake they were off to the other side you know it's really a boat thing and i agree we kind of got locked into that of man we saw them at a couple spots and we got there we could see them chasing but from the bank man you're limited you just can't you can't chase them around and even mm -hmm. in a boat you can get spun out in a boat trying to run around and chase them and 100 because they're so quick you know unless they really have them pinned back in like a you know like a a, cove um, or something. yeah like a cove or like where it's leading out to like a stream yeah yeah you can really screw yourself over so leo's got a good one here what's the best jig for big rocks leo i'm not sure if you're talking are you talking bank fishing or just in general bank fishing i think the best as, as long as the current wind will allow it is a five sixteenth ounce ball head. That's the best size I've got. Traditionally, the best jig is the one that you have the most of at the time. Um, big rocks. I feel like I'm getting broke off. Big rocks is where I, I lose the majority of my, you're going to break. Off. Yeah. That's like, the thing is you're not going to pick a jig that never gets hung up. Mm -hmm. It's just, you try to go light enough to keep bottom contact and go that way, but you're going to lose and, them. Yeah, the heavier not, you go, the more yeah. apt you are to get snagged, though. 
the because they just something. fall into those little cracks and crannies and whatever you want to call them and they just they're down there and you're done you you're not getting those back but then on the other hand um in addition to the five fingers you also you can't go too light because then you're just kind of screwed because you're never going to touch the bottom um you can't feel it yeah yeah so like a perfect example is when i was fishing the mississippi everything that i had excuse me everything that i had made up was bank fishing 3 16th i think was my heaviest and i was struggling the difference between 3 16th and a quarter made all the difference like i could keep pretty consistent bottom contact so you've got to be able to like if you're fishing the bottom you've got to be able to keep that bottom contact and feel everything but not heavy enough that you know oh well if a half ounce is good an ounce will be better right i'll always keep mm -hmm. contact yeah except you're dragging through everything and getting stuck so um good jig color recommendation for this time of year jig From color Joshua. recommendation always black and blue yeah dizzle will die on that hill i mm. tend to be more of a natural color than dizzle so i usually will start with like a green pumpkin ish color um but i kind of let the water clarity determine that you know if it's like how we had today and there's been a bunch of rain that was dirtied up um a darker you know green pumpkin black black and blue something like that that's going to kind of stand out the cleaner mm -hmm. the water is the more natural more translucent i'll get but green pumpkin you know, to me is one of those that you can do well all the time we don't have a ton of super clean waters like that around here the majority of our waters you know you're it, it's usually always stained um or it's you know chocolate milk or you know it's we don't get it in that super super clear or that i usually <laughs> um that i necessarily worry about having to you know oh god i have to make sure that they're not like what is this black and blue thing there's nothing like that in the world here i'm not gonna eat this thing so fatty absolutely or fatty i don't know what, how you say it fishing um conditions can change hourly absolutely that should have been one on our list we're gonna get to three here in a second <laughs> but dude there can i will be, i've been out fishing actually i was out with brando a couple weekends ago and it was nothing 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 and we had an hour spurt that was just insane from 10 to 11 insanity for both of us and after that bite was off and dizzle mm -hmm. days like that where we're almost ready to leave have fished six hours and the last hour of the day is just fire or in the morning we get there in the first two hours in the morning is just insane we go to the rest of the day till three o'clock you know without a bite and then there's some days where you have them sprinkled in all day. Like you find them on wood and every couple pieces of wood you hit is a fish. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, that's a pattern. That's awesome. But it's not always like that. So yeah, great, great. Yeah. Thing to pull up that can change. What did I say at the, uh, as we were walking back, you know, after our jaunt through the woods, I was like, dude, how is this even a thing? It's done nothing but rain for the last two days. And then I pointed up to the sky and the bluebird skies were peeking through. And then we started getting a lot of sun and then snap of a finger. We're back to uh, overcast, cloudy, dreary kind of looking. No rain, but, you know, changes often. Um, this OK, so here's actually a fun. Uh, so from Pat here into number three. So number three, the big thing for me is fishing all three columns of the water. And this is something professional anglers have talked about for a long time. You've got top water, you know, on top of the water. Hence, top water. Uh, you've got subsurface things, moving baits, like spinner baits, chatter baits, and that can be anywhere from a foot under the surface to you know you're slow rolling it. Anywhere in there, in that in that in between, I usually think moving baits, but it could be hopping a Texas rig, you know, yo-yoing a jig, something like that. And then you've got the third column of the water, which is on the bottom, so dragging a Texas rig, Carolina rig, fish are feeding down, you know, looking down, fishing those three columns of the water really started to make sense for me fishing with my dad back in the day. And I didn't really equate it to this, but fishing a spinnerbait for me was one of the biggest confidence lures. Top water was always fun, you know, starting with a popper. Um, I would move to a spinnerbait because I had a ton of confidence in it. And dad would just be absolutely kicking my brains in with a Texas rig, tequila sunrise worm, fishing on the bottom, right? And I never really put the two and two together until his buddy was a good jig fisherman um, switching between the two, like, listen, they're only getting bites on the bottom. Why am I beating this dead horse of throwing a spinner bait when I haven't had a bite in an hour and a half? You know, I would switch over to like a lizard, though I wouldn't, I wouldn't beat dad, but I'd still get a few bites, right? Or I'd switch over to um my thing was always a red shad, a red shad worm. 
I was always like, this is the color. It's going to be dead. Never did. But once I would switch that worm or something on bottom, like a hula grub. Actually, I saw that Rage um, is bringing out their own version of a hula grub, which mm. I was excited about, um, which is like a twin tail grub on the back. And it's got like a soft plastic skirt. Let me bring one up here. Yeah, I was just going to say, you, but... grab one of those. Yeah. So go ahead, Dizzle. I don't know if you have any any input on fishing the three columns, three different columns in the water to find more success. So basically what I'm saying is don't get so locked into one thing like they're going to be on a spinnerbait. It could be the difference of they're really they're really fishing up because generally you want to stay above the fish like when they're actively looking like mm -hmm. ice fishing or jigging. You generally want to feed up above them where they can look up and grab it. It's easier unless they're really in those rocks and stuff, you know, focused on crawls and such. But as far as a moving bait, generally keeping it up above them where they can see it and come up to it easier for them to attack. Um, I just had something in mind. On it, it completely left. You were going to go hula jig, hula rage. Yeah, but I was going to say something else on that point, mm. but I don't know. Dang, I just got to say real fast, Debo, that whiteboard's pretty cool. Dude, it's, I don't even want to talk about it. I've had stuff Yeesh. going on. Um, yeah, giving you a hard time, buddy. Let yeah. me uh, color, cover the, um, or give you my take on the uh, water columns. Yes, I give, have us, an, give us your column take, Dizzle. Maybe I'll do I a giveaway. Have, Listen, let's carve away. We've got almost 200 people in here. If we get to 220 people watching, invite your friends, invite your aunt. I'll make room somewhere here to do a oh, giveaway. Oh, dang. The likes are much, much better. We got one. Oh, geez. We were at 189. We just dropped to 182 uh, with Ooh. 131 likes. Amazing job. As soon as I said invite people, if we get to 200, <laughs> they're like, nope. I want a free giveaway. Doing, um, water columns. I have a hard time with that finite line of thinking that I can just burn a spinner bait or, you know, burn a, a, an underspin and kind of work that top ish range. I, I try to uh, put that round peg in a square hole too often and force stuff through where I really need to take a step back and actually, you know, get a lure that's supposed to go on the top or, you know, get a lure that's supposed to be that hardcore middle and not, you know, trying to force it where I've said it a hundred times before I'll, I'll do whatever I can with a jig. I'll, I'll yo-yo it. I'll, you know, I'll swim it back, you know, I'll do all this stuff. Um, and that actually hurts me quite a bit. Um, especially when, you know, you and I are out fishing I will, you know, see you doing something specific and I'm like, I'm going to make this thing work. I'm not going to change because why would I do that? I'm just going to make it work. So here's, I couldn't find the, uh, the strike King one. They must not have it up out for sale. It was on Instagram and I commented, I was like, Oh, that's sick. Um, but a four inch, I always called him a hula grub like Yamamoto does. It's a, a twin curly tail with essentially a soft plastic skirt on the front. And you just take a jig, so like boss jigs, I should have done two separate tabs here. I agree with everybody else. I hate the new. So like the thing with the new brands is like when you go to a like a brand or a, like a rod or reel or whatever, when you click all brands, it doesn't have. So like if, if I go to D, I don't think it has Daiwa in here. Oh, it does. Maybe it's on mobile. Anyway, I don't know. I'm old and I don't like the new website but and get off my yard you yeah, kids get off my lawn tackle warehouse uh so boss jigs let's say they have some really really nice jig heads that you can buy um as just the head so there's like an all-terrain one that i like uh this one dock knocker like for flipping around wood and stuff this thing is freaking sick and it shows i think the top view here there you go so coming through wood most rock and such awesome little jig at three eight ounce but you would take that hula grub thread it on here just like a regular jig and fish it just like that and i think can i just go back to it i'm 100 making oh. a note right now to start referring to you as doc knocker <laughs> old doc knocker debo <laughs> sounds like a good uh good nickname for me but yeah the hula grub i don't know where else i was going with that but if you haven't tried them chompers makes one yamamoto makes one somebody else was just uh commented on my how do you get to colors? I oh, see their color thing is mixed up now too. Get off my lawn. <laughs> They've got a, oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, baby. Are, Talk to me, sweet. Are they getting rid of? They're not getting rid of the menace, though, are they? Strike King. This is no, a no, new no, no. total. This is just uh, so I could yeah, see it anyway, kind of being never a menace, a menace type and this, of lure. This is flat on top too, like a worm. Mm. So like once you push that skirt back, it's just a flat edge there where it would bump up against it. But easy um, knock knocker. Yeah, old Doc Knock Debo. Um, let's see, where else am I going here? My goodness, I'm way behind on chat. Um, let's see, Jim, what he say? The two main things to find fish is depth and speed. Adjust until mm. you find the right combination. That's a good point because I think it was Pat asked again, how many times do I switch baits or spots before I know? That's the worst for me. Like. I literally don't know sometimes if I need to switch a bait, switch a color, or switch switch the exact spot where I'm fishing. Like, oh, they're here. It's just I don't have the right color or I don't have the right depth or that's something I'm really bad at. And I think that's, to me, finding fish is the biggest difference between just being like a recreational weekend angler and being somebody who's a pro who can consistently find fish Mm -hmm. is the ability to locate fish consistently hands down, I think is the biggest thing that pros do better than just somebody that likes to come out and fish. So. Agreed. They don't, they don't, you know, pigeonhole themselves into trying to make it work. My man critical in here. I've, I've got two answers for this. Spend time on the water or spend time watching YouTube, this or that. Do I answer with my brain? Or do I answer with my heart? My heart says, if you're watching Debo's fishing, spend more time watching YouTube. My brain says, absolutely get out and fish. Spending time on the water, there is absolutely no other way to get better than being out on the water and actually putting this stuff to, to practice. Painfully boring fishing, 3.30. That was us today, man. Uh, become a new member. Thank you, my good sir, for becoming a new member. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh, I'm way behind. So people are talking about jig colors, um, black, blue, and purple. I like that, Mr. Randall Williams Sully. Um, oh, what else dang. We got? Rage is coming out with a lot of crazy stuff, aren't they? I don't know. Do they have a thing showing all their new stuff? <laughs> yeah, they're coming out with a rap share it. rage crawl. Do do your uh dizzle dizzle share um, thing. Yeah, hold on. Ooh, pop, pop, man. And that could be a complete whole live slash video in its own. I mean, I think there's, there's really the two ways to fish a jig that are the most, like if we're not talking a swim jig, in my mind, it's either flipping and pitching a jig to, um, to targets. So if I'm flip, flipping and pitching around brush docks, that kind of stuff, flipping and pitching a jig uh is one way and then there's dragging it around structure so hopping it dragging it and i'll kind of switch between both of those and dizzle maybe can give you some more tips but you know sometimes they want it kind of hopped on the bottom you know pop 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 there's sometimes you're just dragging it you know so mm -hmm. you see this the rage menace worm they already have those oh not that really? one the gravel dog so the yeah. rage rage worm is just the cut tail what is it called the rage um yeah, it just has the one, the one, doesn't it? Or is it two? It's just got one. Yeah, it's a cut tail worm. Yeah. That one is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the like the Zoom. Dog. Zoom has one that came out. I think Hank, Hank Cherry had a really good, was that maybe last year on that Zoom one that has the twin tail? This is like a, uh, like a little um, crappy worm. Yeah, I but it's it's a six inch worm. You could probably Wait, what? Debo, Mr. You, crappy maxi worm. Yeah, it's a that's not right. A, it's a six inch worm. That's not right. What do you mean? That's it's not, not right. a crappy worm. Yeah, no, I have no idea why they call that a crappy worm at all. That makes no sense. Um that must could, be a different uh, thing or something. You could drop shot that Debo. They already have these. That's the filler worm. It's I've already got Zeus? some of those. Not the Zeus worm, the that Zeus? filler worm, the laminated. It's like a robo worm. I've already got some of yeah. these. I've got the purple ones. The Those. Zeus worm, it's a nine and a half inch worm. That came out actually at last year's iCast. I don't think it did oh, very well. Rage, the Striking Rattling. slash Rage didn't have their own curly tail worm. So I think they were trying to get into that, but I don't know that it did. 
The cool thing about that worm, though, is it has like segments. So if you find they're eating like a certain size, you can't oh, yeah, really you can see it there, but you can right break there. it off. There's yeah. one there and one there. Which you could do that to any worm, but if they're segmented, you can pull it off at a point and it's going to have a pointed head. Whereas like mm -hmm. if I did that to a power worm, it's just going to have a complete flat nose on it. Mm -hmm. The rattle mm -hmm. and rage craw. Yeah, so they when they have different things, that's not the rage hawk. The rage hawk is that one I was excited about that has the wings that kick backwards that looks like the, um, mm. uh, God, what is it? The man's, not dragonfly, mosquito hawk, I think is what they called it. Mm. <clears throat> so that's yeah. the rattle and rage chunk. Yeah, they're, and that's, is this their website? Yeah, Strike King website. That's jacked up as all hell. Where was the, did it show the hula grub or no? No, I was, I was trying to find it and I couldn't, I saw this, the gravel dog. Well, the gravel dog's a crankbait. Now that I say that, that's their crankbait that they came out with. That's like the, um, rock crawler. This, this entire thing just doesn't make sense whatsoever. Yeah, I don't know. That's as... not the, that's not the gravel dog. All right, All right I'm done sharing. I'm out of here. <laughs> my name, my name's Doug and I'm out of here I'm out. okay Where's number four let's get in what are we at we're at 40 minutes hey we're actually staying on track here number four this is actually a dizzle one this is perfect time because i gotta pee i didn't pee beforehand i was trying to get this stuff done so number four different casts casting proficiency and casting mm -hmm. accuracy so dizzle kind of lumped all these together i'm gonna let dizzle take over for a second i gotta go pee run run fast um so yeah i think one of the bigger things to just uh, overall i mean this kind of seems like a no-brainer but it's becoming proficient or at least knowing when you should use x cast versus y cast things like that um before we started i i was telling debo um for some reason i thought you know i have no other options as far as um lures to throw and things like that so i threw on an a rig today here in iowa we can only have two live um arms of the a rig um just not being used to throwing something that large of a bait um so what was it five arms total um my shoulder hurts and i feel like just because i have no idea what i'm doing with an a rig i probably was doing it wrong so that's one thing that I could definitely get a lot more practice in is, you know, casting bigger baits. I don't like bigger baits. I hate bigger baits. I would rather, you know, keep to the, the Nessier uh, side of it. Um, but the other big thing is, is not assuming that you have to be the, um, the end all be all master of all things casting um start with the one that you are you know obviously a little bit more confident in um if it's the kind of overhead axi choppy type of uh cast get good with that and then once you get good with that you can modify it a little bit to um you know Overhead axe throw kind of goes into a sidearm, kind of goes into a roll, kind of goes into a pitch. So once you, you know, start feeling more comfortable with at least one of them, you can kind of, you know, get everything a little bit more dialed in. And, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, you'll get uh, you'll get that comfort feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm good with casting. I'm at least decent at casting people saying they miss the old old tackle warehouse uh, site i know I, I agree yep spider jig uh or spider rig i've heard people call it there's something else they call it too not a hula grub a um a, a skirted grub i've heard people call it fishing spider a skirted big. grub oh no yep um let's see i don't know kuda was talking about something i'm friends with the guys but it vibrates like no other not sure what that was for. Old school chompers. Yep. Old school chompers, hula grub. And it actually was, um, God, who was it now that I'm thinking about that? Kalen's. I think it was a Kalen's is what I used to use back in the day. And I think they still sell them at Walmart. They used to sell them as a skirted hula grub, like a one pack. I forget who makes them. I don't think it was them. 
don't think it was chompers, but they used to sell them in a one pack where it's already ready to go on a jig head. The hook sucked on it. So you got to sharpen the hook or, um, yeah. Anyway, another tangent and I've lost my, uh, my whole deal there. Oh my God. Chompers has some strong smell ever, dude. Chompers garlic scent on those. Like if you crack open a bag, they are bad upon bad. They are, they're pungent, pungent. Um, let's see. So I don't know what all Dizzle uh, talked about here, but one thing that I will say for me, close enough is good enough is what I used to think. If I get close enough to it, that's good enough, right? Not a fish on it. Um, man, as I have gotten more into fishing, uh, you will soon find out that close enough isn't always good enough. Sometimes you've got to be able to hit the spot like the size of a dinner plate, if not smaller, right? Sometimes it's in the complete heart, the middle of that wood to get that bite. Fishing a foot, two feet the off crotch. the spot. The crotch. Yeah, the crotch of the wood. Fishing a foot or two foot off it sometimes is not going to get the, the bite. I'm sorry, but it just won't. So accuracy over distance, as Dizzle was talking about casts and accuracy. You know, people focus so much on how far can I cast or how, how far can I bomb the lure. Nine times out of ten, I'll take accuracy over distance anytime. Yeah. And, you know, that was one thing I kind of touched on is, you know, a lot of people when they start fishing, they hammer very well done. Um, they start with your basic overhand, you know, chopping type of motion. You know, you're usually with that, you're, you're bombing it. You're going distance. You're really getting it out there. And then, you know, that kind of gives you a little bit more, you know, feel for casting. And then you can kind of move into your sidearm and then your roll and then your pitch and then your flip and your skip and the whole nine it's don't think that you're going to go out there and day one you know skip under docks i've been fishing i don't even know how many years i've been fishing and i just, i suck at skipping yeah and it just comes with practice yeah i've been able to cast right and left-handed you know casting usually right-handers are going to cast better to their left the backhand cast for a right-handed caster going off to the right is going to be harder. Um, and not only just casting, working the lure back as well. Yep. Yeah. And one big thing, if you're if you're struggling as a right-hander or a left-hander, just going across your body is generally going to be the, the dominant way you cast. That backhand cast on that short side, get used to letting it go sooner than you think you normally would on a regular mm -hmm. cast. It'll it, be in it's a lot funny. better spot. It's funny if I'm facing, you know, facing dead on to the lake and let's say I'm throwing a jerk bait. I really want to cast it to my right. So I work that back with my right hand and it mm -hmm. it's easier for That's me. normal. Yep. If That's I your cast it to my left, I'm no longer going to be facing, you know, straight dead on to the body of water. I'm actually going to turn a little bit, not even a little bit. Excuse me. I'm going to turn a lot. That way I can still use that right hand, you know, kind of popping retrieve. It just still doesn't feel natural for me to work it back from left to right versus for me, my confidence, my comfort is right to left. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. It's going to be that way normally for, for most folks, right or left handed casting across your body usually going to be the strong side. This is the one Dax is this the uh, the one that Buddy Gross was using. I was thinking it was Hank Cherry for some reason, but um yeah, that Zoom Z craw is a good little cry. I've had a couple videos fishing that one the June bug color specifically have caught some good fish on it. Cool, kind of like a mix between a cuttail worm and a a craw deal. Kind of a fun bait if you want a, a mix. Yeah, the man's mosquito hawk is the one fishing after dark. Yes, sir. I'm excited about it. I want to try that rage hawk. Uh, I don't care what people say, and I want to try it. Dude, it's it's old stuff coming back. You know, how often do we see those old lures or old designs mm -hmm. kind of come back around? And um, let's see. Got questions on that lock. Yeah, locking certain baits in your hand, you can get in trouble. Yeah, you can if you're struggling. Absolutely. Landing the lure in the right spot is important. Absolutely. Especially the first time, because if you have a really good spot like this was talking about docks you go to wing it under there and you hit it and bang make a bunch of noise and getting your mm -hmm. lure off or if you try to throw one good cast in that brush pile and get it snagged and you're shaking it and trying to get it free you've blown up those spots right so making that good spot that first time 
can be paramount. Dizzle, what you got in private chat? Um, oh, you already oh, touched yeah. on that one. I saw that one. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Somebody else was saying, oh, <laughs> Dan. Okay. Hold on. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Thermal printer, Guggen squad question, metanium giveaway, stubby pillow. Take a drink. Yeah. You know, it, it, you kind of touched on this a little bit more with, you know, banging against the dock and things like that. Um, you know, back in the day when I really first kind of got back into fishing and me and old Johnny would go to, you know, to hick and, you know, fish different things and stuff like that. And I would just be like, you know, going balls to the wall. I'm like, I'm getting out here because I know if I stand on this dock and I cast over this way, I can do this and I can do that. And he would always be like, you know, constantly, you know, two or three times in a row have to be like, dude, stop. Don't go out on the dock yet. Fish the damn dock first before you just go running out there because fish, you know, kind of like to hang out near docks and things like that. So, yep. Fish. And that's actually one of the things when I was talking about casting angles. So I was trying to do a, and I know this looks like children's drawings, but I was trying to use my, uh, my fancy phone and talk about fishing the spots close to you first. This is exactly what Dizzle's talking about as a, so this, what this is supposed to look like is this is a tree laying down in the water. So as you walk up to it, this is a tree that's laying down flat out in front of you. It looks like a tree, like I'm fishing up, but pretend like it's this way. So you walk up to it and the tree's laying out here. This is the bank, this brown stuff. If you can't tell, that's bank. Uh, Mm -hmm. All the ones are the spots I would hit first, all the closest stuff. Two, even though the crotch that I talked to you about right there. So many crotches in that hand-drawn yeah, picture. Just a little, so many a crotches. Little, little tickle right there in the crotch. That's the absolute juice on a lay down. I don't ever throw there first. I always work what's closest and then work my way out. Whoops, work, work my way out this way. And then I kept trying to save like diagrams so I could show you guys and do a slideshow of like, okay, here's the wood. Where would you cast first? And then I started drawing on it and doing stuff. And then it was like saving stuff blank. Same thing for uh, when I was talking about like casting on that jetty. I was going to sh- have like some fun diagrams Whoa. made up. Yeah. Cast one and cast two. Did I just blow your mind? Pretty much. But, uh, and then your, it started saying all your everything. drawings are stellar. You like that? Vincent Debo over here. Hey, uh, y'all didn't know, but I'm actually an artist. Then <laughs> it started saving everything blank. I don't know why. So. Cisco, good question. If you only had one bait to fish with to save your life, what will it be? Well, what what is what is saving my life consist of? Catching a fish over two pounds, catching any fish, catching fish to eat. I, yeah, I take it as a uh, deserted island type of. You got one usable uh, combo with one usable lure. You gotta live. I would say a two inch grub on a jig head. Mm. Two inch so, white grub, two or three inch white grub, two and a half inch white grub on a jig head. Chartreuse jig head done. Three fourths of a Debo finger grub on a jig. You know, honestly, that is one of the most under talked about, underrated fishing lure out there. I mean, it just works. Grubs are amazing. I like the idea of that, but I'm going to take a jig. Um, But if you're on a deserted island and you get snagged and lose it. I'm going to handcraft. I'm (laughs) I'm going to impale my jugular with my snapped off line with no, or my snapped off rod because I'm so furious that I just lost everything to live by, I guess. I don't know. Um, Liam, good question. How should I fish a lake with lots of grass and wood, but doesn't have any contour? So I'm guessing you're talking fishing Mm. from the bank or without electronics, right? Because what we can't see, we don't know about. And oftentimes there's holes. So like there could be a big dip or like a riverbed that you can't see out there. Great spot for fish to hide. But obviously if you're in the bank or you don't have electronics, you can't see that. How do you fish those? Same way we're talking about now. Are they on the edges of it? Are they in the submerged stuff? Are they in? And oftentimes it's just trying to take a mental note of how deep they are. Mm -hmm. Like when you're fishing that wood or those drop off jetties, is every single bite coming within four foot of the bank? Or are you really having to bomb it out there and every, every fish you're getting is 
you know, 20 yards off the bank. They're all, they all seem to be out in that, that depth area. And if there, if it is, you know, kind of a flat type of, you know, no contour and weeds are, are there any pockets? Are there any openings? Are there, you know, different things like that? Where Irregularities. You can maybe, yes. Irregularities where you can kind of, you know, pitch something in there and, you know, maybe not directly in there, maybe a little bit behind and kind of pull it through for one angle, kind of no bites, kind of go a little bit to your right or your left. If you can try to hit it again from a different angle. I mean, don't give up on it if there's one cast with no results. Yeah, I still um, remember one of the the bigger fish that I caught around here. It was like it was just under six pounds on a brush pile. And I flipped to it probably 10 times, 12 times before finally getting a bite and hitting it. And, and there was nothing different about the flip. It was just I was like, dude, this is a big brush pile. My only thought was there's got to be hmm. one fish on it. And like on the 15th or whatever, you know, flip to it boom almost six pounder what did what did you say today on the on the solo fish that i caught you said something to the effect of how the hell did you catch a fish right there i beat that thing up for how long and didn't get a single bite and then i figured out he mike longed it he literally shanked this poor fish in the side oh bad i got him good old is alone um, Everett, yeah, great question. I always fish closest. So like as a bank angler, I'm always thinking of if I hook a fish and I get a fish on this cast, am I get what whatever I'm bringing it back through, I'm going to disrupt. So I always try to go mm -hmm. as close as I can in the outsides of it. And then I start to get into the more gnarly spots to the middle of it, you know, trying to cast past it, that type of thing. See, I, I usually, you know, I have the same kind of mindset as what you do. Except for I'm thinking, oh, man, when I snag on this uh, structure, um, maybe I can salvage the back end of it if I'm, you know, right up front and maybe, you know, break off a little branch here or there or something like that. Oh, man. Uh, I sent you a private chat. Good question. I think. Frank Scalish impersonator. Who's a, who's impersonating old Uncle Frank? Is Frank in here? I didn't see him. Maybe I missed it. That'd be cool if Uncle Frank was in here. We need to get him on again. Talk about a dude that's a wealth of info. He was fun. Fine wood, pitch to wood, pitch to crotch of wood. It's like a Fine Dr. Tree. Seuss tree. <laughs> oh, so many crotches. That tree is all crotch. Yeah, I know. Oh, you guys kill me. Uh, what was your question, Dizzle? I'm sorry. I got sidetracked here. Um... I don't know if Paul was asking in gen in general or was this an actual question for everybody. But at 832, Paul asks, what's the worst mistake a great angler is going to make? What the hell? Paul's still in here. Paul, why didn't you join us? You should have said, hey, invite me on. Stay until the end. Okay, let's I'm going to ping that one. Hold on. Mm -hmm. And there was one up here that I just said, okay, Bassless. Um, what has been your biggest failure to lure this year? Hmm, that's a good question. Dizzle, do you have one? Do you know? Do you, you want an honest, 100% hmm. real life answer? I already know mine. Yeah. It's going to be the jig. As much as I love the jig, it has failed me and failed me and Hold failed me. There we go. We muted Dizzle because I don't care what he says going forward. That man's caught so many fish on a jig. If he if he pretends like he's going to say the jig has let him down this year. All right, I'm letting it, you out of timeout. It has it, honestly, it has let me down. The All right, guys. Well, I'm flying solo for the rest of the night. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. Now I'm, now I'm pressing the wrong buttons, <laughs> trying to so, add him back and unmute him. So this is, this is my take on this out of the big fish that I've caught this year. None of them have been on a jig. Granted, I may have caught a decent amount of fish on a jig, but I've, you know, done work with the, I, I wouldn't say that's letting you down. Let's, let's I feel like it has fish let on a down. jig. I've watched you catch fish on a jig. Sure. Let's let's like talk it, about a lure that you thought would be good, 
or that you had high hopes for that suck? I'm going to go first. Hellraiser. I had multiple. I was out with Steven. Steven's. We need to get Steven on a live to hang out with us. Steven was my uh, my stand in Dizzle while Dizzle was out doing Nebraska things. Um, he talks crap just like Dizzle. He makes fun of me like Dizzle. He's basically a Dizzle clone. And when, when we all three went out, they both picked on me. It was horrible. Um, but I was out with him one day and had like six good blow ups on a Hellraiser. And that's going to be part of my best and worst for the year. For me, hookup ratio on the Hellraiser sucked strawberries. It's bad. And I had multiple other days where I got a couple bites on it and blow ups on it. No hookup. I don't have one down here, but I think the whole blade. I'll show this. I broke I broke off one of the the hooks on one of the trebles. No idea on what, but that really bums me out that their hooks are that fragile that I broke. You broke one like of the, the hook off of one? Yeah, like off of one of the treble is still there, but it's only a double treble instead of a triple. No idea. Would you say it's a double treble treble? No, or I've if you're a that. if you're a Star Trek fan, the, the trouble with tribbles. Ooh, I just went really nerdy right there. I would never say that either. The wannabe Furbies. What's happening? Yeah, the wannabe, the wannabe critters is what they were. It was critters, wasn't it? Um, uh, did these not are these not sorted or did I just miss it? Um, oh did my you god, search Heck Razor. I should have, but I just went Z-Man figuring I can just scroll down. Oh, here it oh, is. Right there. Um, See, my big thing, it doesn't show. Why does it not show it? It shows the back one off. There's also a hook here on the front mm -hmm. of it. Am I sharing? Okay. Yeah. There's also a hook here, a treble hook here, and this is where you tie it to. I will say that after I got it in the water, I had a lot of confidence. I was like, this thing actually sounds cool. It looks cool. It kind of sounds like bait fish running on the top. After So... Before, when we saw it at ICAST last year, oh, no. I thought, sorry, I thought pike lure. <laughs> Not necessarily bass. It looks kind of stupid, but I bet pike would crush that. After I got it on the water, I thought, actually, I can see this thing working. I saw Gramps fish it, caught a big fish on it that one day. Put it on the water. I'm like, first time I fished it, okay, this thing actually has something to it. This looks pretty cool. And then we go back to actually hooking fish on it. And I think this is the culprit. I think they're grabbing at this. And this is all in the way of their mouth and yeah hookup ratio blue for me so i don't know fish and friends i was thinking about putting multiple split rings here to bring this hook back it's going to be more of a snag hazard but creating some room between this this is actually you know what this is and this is what i was convinced it was z-man if we're going back to brands here strike king used to have a, a hard bait uh, we'll see just like this. Why do, why do I not have Strike King hard baits? Tackle warehouse. I don't like the changes. If we go to Strike King hard baits, do they even sell it? They might, oh, they do. I'm convinced that Z-Man bought up all the XX. Oh my gosh. Excess? We just went triple X rated here. All the excess Strike King, uh, rage blades. Stole the blades off of them, made the Hellraiser. So anyway, Hellraiser hookup I mean, ratio for me sucked. I, but. I do have to kind of say, uh, I've, I've fished it a few times. Like I said, I broke off that front treble or broke off one of the front trebles. Um, I've only caught one fish on it, you know, no big deal. I mean, it was, it was over five pounds, but you know, yeah, tough guy. Must be nice. Um, oh, here's the question. Know, was, do you remember, was it hooked in the front or the back hook that had it? I mean, it was both. Oh, I mean, it was a pig. It, you know, it was giant, giant mouth. But I also took um, BBC's recommendation of you, you don't have to just burn it back to you after you cast it. He said, you know, let it sink and then kind of yo-yo it back. I let it sink because yeah, I kind of backlashed it. So it sank all the way down. And then I started pulling it up, reeling it up, kind of, you know, it gets that chatter type of thump. And yeah, that, that's what dynamite. I said. They remind me of a suic. Like if for mm -hmm. you musky guys out there that know a suic, that's what it reminds me of is a, a bait that gets down and you're, you're popping it. So I can see where that would work. But 
you're flirting with the devil there because you're going to get hung up with that thing pretty quick. Oh, yeah. um, Paul, so sorry, coming back to Paul's question. And then we'll get a giveaway going here. We didn't ever hit 200, but listen, I love y'all. I just want to see if we get 200. I'll, I'll still do a daggum giveaway. What's the worst mistake a great angler is going to make? The worst mistake. Dude, that's so like situational. I don't even know that. Oh, actually, I know it. I, I know the biggest mistake you can make. And I ponder it all the time. And I can't tell you how many times I'm glad I didn't do what I thought I was going to do because it was successful. I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I'm going to do and freak out. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What? Number one worst mistake you can make as an angler is not going out to fish. Mm. I can't tell you how many days, how many trips, like literally I've had amazing trips where I'm like, mm. do I go? Do I not go? And I usually say this at the end of the videos when I'm pondering it. And I'm like, I don't know. I've got, I've got stuff I could probably do or, and then you go out and you crush it tons of times where I've had that. Even if, like you said, hashtag hour to fish, Dizzle says it all the time. Hashtag hour to fish is all I've got. I'm still going to go out and fish for that hour because can't catch your PB if you're not wet in the line. So that's my biggest mistake that an angler can make is deciding not to go on that day. Even if you don't catch fish, barring some sort of like large accident or something happening, and it's usually something out of your control anyway. Even if you go out and don't catch fish, it's still fun. Like mm -hmm. you're still out enjoying. There's I can think of 18 million things worse than going out enjoying nature and not catching fish. So I mean, there was there was a time that earlier this summer it was the hottest week that we had on record, hands down. Um, it was you know at nine o'clock at night. It was still over 90 degrees, and then with a real feel of you know pushing a hundred. I went out each one of those nights, three nights. I think I maybe caught, you know, a dozen fish over those three nights, but three of those dozen were all over five pounds. So it's that just... was, yes, I agree completely. Dizzle. I just erased uh, Mr. Fat Boy Fishing. I was going to send him a bunch of large shirts. If he's in here, he's got, uh, he's got my number. He'll help me up anyway. Um, um, he should now be skinny boy fishing because he's lost like, I don't know, a hundred pounds. Congrats to that freaking guy. I want to say before you move away here, the whiteboard, I mean, obviously it is full, but, uh, my answer to that biggest mistake question yes. is believing it to an extent, believing that you are a great angler. I'm, I, I can be good at times. But I'm nowhere near a great angler. Hmm. I'm not going so you think to just overconfidence assume. can be the biggest downfall. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent. I mean, there's always going hmm. to be somebody that's going to be better than what you are. You're never going to be the best of some specific thing forever. Somebody's always going to catch up with you. That's interesting because you're not you're not fishing in a direct head-to-head -head sport or hobby, you know, however you want to make it. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting that you pick that because it's always you against the fish. It's never you against another angler. I mean, I it is say, obviously when you're doing weights, but you're never technically facing that other person. It's always you versus the fish. It's not like, you know, boxing where you get overconfident. There's always going to be that guy that you look over and. I don't, I don't no, necessarily ever need to have necessarily an opponent. Each time I go out, I, I want a best what I did the last time it went out. So I'm always, you know, I feel like if there's not some sort of competition or some sort of something to give me drive, I'm never going to necessarily put forth a hundred percent or, you know, 110% or whatever you want to call it. I need something. I don't necessarily need it, but it helps me out and it makes me a better fisherman or, I used to play ping pong all the time. I used to play golf all the time. Those little wins here and there to better myself. If it's just me out doing something. Mr. Chris a, Russ just sent me this. He said, don't feel bad, Dizzle. He wacky rig side hooked a, a bass today mm -hmm. too. Mine was really, mine was a full on trocar that almost pulled all the way through. Yeah. When, when Dizzle, when Dizzle released it and threw it back into the water, it looked like, have y'all ever seen that, that movie, the Meg 
the really big shark. It looked like the Meg took a bite out of it because there was just a huge blood oil spill patch from Dizzle murdering that I, fish. Basically, I thought at first you were going to say, have you guys ever seen in Seattle where they throw dead fish at each other in the market? <laughs> what are we going to do for a giveaway tonight? I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Lunker Hunt Spider. That was never at the top of my list of being a, ever. a good lure. Um, good. You know, outside of the triples. <laughs> Uh, okay, I started a couple other ones here. Uh, so that was Joshua painfully. Okay, so I guess I've got one left here. We're going to get into some more questions and do a Real giveaway. Quick. We're actually growing in numbers. Yeah, go ahead. The other lure, I thought I could somewhat figure out like a glide bait or, you know, a swim bait, something like that. You know, the jointed swim baits. I thought I could figure that out because I've really put in a decent effort to fish them this year and i don't feel like i necessarily i don't feel like i necessarily saw any progress in them i i you know caught a couple luck fish on you know like a a buka and stuff like that but for the amount of time i felt like i fished them i didn't get hardly any results on which one i'm sorry i was going through um glide baits jointed swim baits oh. things like that you know some of those bigger baits that you we know, don't put honestly, enough time. Let's be honest. We don't. We try it for a while. Like I we've really got did whole days to it. I don't. I really anyway. did try this year. That was one of the combos that I brought with me almost every single time I went out fishing. Granted, I didn't, you know, spend half of the day of my outing with it, but I was still giving it a shot. I was still, you know, part of it was trying to be proficient with, you know, casting, retrieving things like that. How it looks, what kind of speed I need to use, and stuff like that. And I just didn't, it was not very much, uh, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, if you will. Well said, Dizzle. Somebody said the man's dancer. That looks more like a blade with a feather treble in back, though. Were you trying to share? Like no. A spoon. No, I was just looking. And it, well, I don't know why the hell it went to a. Your tiny dancer, is that what you said? No, the man's, somebody said the man's, oh, kind of. Oh, actually, kind of the more you, it's interesting. Hold on. Let me share here. This is one that I didn't have. Oh, and I got a donation. Thank you. Whoever just dropped a tin bomb on me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, stop sharing and then represent sharing man's dancer. So this is, oh, actually, hold on. Dude, old, eh? I think I might have just, um, so funny thing, my aunt, well, not funny at all, but um, her father passed away. So my, my wife's grandpa, um, passed away some time ago, but she brought an old, um, tackle box of his, and I wanted to get retro on for a live and do an unboxing and talking to retro again, because he's one of the coolest down to earth cats who only fishes the old retro stuff. And this is that and man's an amazing theme song, man. Yeah. Who has the best theme song hands down Ever. on all of YouTube. Retro bassin kicking some ass and we're in a real jacket. So I thought it was Ray Ban means... glasses. Oh, I thought it was a rayon jacket. Is it Ray Ban glasses? I, I think it's rayon both, jacket, like but an I old don't starter. know which ones. Well, yeah, it's both. I think well, different versions. Just I don't Hold on. I might have one of those. Um, I'll check here in a second, but no. Oh. Let's see. Let's get to some questions here as we get into. So I've got one pegged. Such yeah, fishing history can be a big mistake. Absolutely. Places change so mm. much that. Hey, Ephraim, I completely agree. Biggest mistake is not going out. And Dude, Jason, I say this all the time, thinking the fish aren't biting. They always are somewhere on something. I completely agree. You just haven't figured it out. How often do you see, even watching the pros, guys that do this for a living, guys that have made millions catching fish, catching stupid little green and brown fish in the water, can go out and skunk, and there's somebody else that's caught, you know, 36 pounds that day, or, you know, something crazy, or it's like, I literally didn't catch a single fish, and that guy caught five, six pounders. How is that even true? Um... Pro anglers often probably fish too fast. <sighs> See, that's the thing is you don't have time because 
like Patrick on a lot of these places, I used to think that too, when the pros will say, yeah, put the trolling motor on eight and just scoot down the bank. You know, a lot of them are looking just to get their first five fish and then they can slow down. But if you don't even have five, like you're not in the running, right? Unless it's a super slow, tough deal, you know, so it's kind of the deal of, of not spending too much time in one spot looking for those active, aggressive fish versus putting all your chips on one 100 yard spot and hoping that they're all there. You know, it's kind of a make or break all in or, or nothing. <laughs> Hammer, you're uh, you're dancing with the devil there. Biggest mistake taking your wife out to fish. Just kidding, dear. Um, let's see. Let's get to this starred one real quick. So, Dan, <laughs> thermal, thermal printer supplies equals more giveaways. Actually, funny enough, I don't think I can get it over here to show you guys, but my thermal printer... I've got, how crazy is this? I've gone through 200 thermal printer labels. I've shipped almost 200 things between my, when I was doing crankbaits and giveaways. It's not all giveaways. Um, when I was actually painting and selling crankbaits and giveaways, 200 labels. That's pretty freaking insane. Dan, I'll drink to that. Thanks for the $10, brother. Hey, uh, Debo, I haven't gotten my Debo sticker yet. Just saying. I do have a few left. Let's see. Um, actually, I haven't seen him. Ruben, is Ruben Esquillen on tonight? I want to get some I want to get some of the fancy ones like Kuda got. Kuda, I need to hit you up. People can't see it, but I've got Kuda stickers back there. I gave mm. Dizzle some Kuda stickers back here on the back of my door. <clears throat> but Kuda got the really nice like vinyl ones. These are nice, but they're not like that kind of matte texture. Anyway, Ruben Esquillen, I had stickers for you uh, on the members only. Can you see and this it bounced back one? to me as not deliverable. See this one? No. This. The solo. Get, oh, yep. hey. The Jig Squad <clears throat> one right there. Um, and then I think I have more on the side. You guys wouldn't be able to see that. So tonight's giveaway will include a Debo sticker. I still think I've got like maybe 40 left. So Debo sticker plus some, some lures. The winner can kind of call it whatever the winner wants. If I've got it, I'll just kind of send it and tailor Matan it to you, my friend. Matanium, zillion. Not a matanium, within reason. If it's, a, hey, if you need like a budget reel, maybe I've got one laying around. We'll see what the winner needs, but. Um, so Dan, thank you very much, dude. I appreciate that. Anybody that donates, always a huge thank you. West by God Ventures. Uh, what has been your go-to lure for this year? It's tapered off. Earlier in the year, it was a top spin versus an underspin. Those were the two that I could almost put on and guarantee I was going to catch a fish. My go-to this year? Hands down is a, j just kidding, Chatterbait. Chatterbait really made a comeback for me this year, 100%. It was one of those lures that I, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what. I, maybe I, you know, honed my inner gramps and was just like, I'm chattering it. I don't even care. Chatterbait, chatterbait, chatterbait. Whatever it was, whatever I did, whatever conditions I ran into, chatterbait was one outside of the jig that I was leaving home without. Let's see. Let's get, we just, we actually just hit 200. So I can't think of a, a better time. Let's roll a giveaway here and let's, let's do, let's see. Hashtag. I, I do love... also just have to say I was not Oops. set up properly. I've had to fix my mic stand twice now during this live. It's been awesome. Well, way to be prepared there, Dizzle. Thanks for taking <laughs> these lives seriously. Um, what oh, should we okay, do? Mr. Hashtag... I get up and get up and pee during the thing. I, I can't control my, you got, you got to go. You got to go. That's what I tell my <laughs> girls. Don't be, don't be upset. You got to go. You got to go. Um, I'm going to piss people off by having to type this. Halfenda? Halfenda. Halfenda. Um, God, what was that? Hashtag Hawks. Oh, oh, yeah. Now the, uh, which it won't uh, won't exist next year, but the 
Big Ten West leaders right now, Hawks. You know, no big deal. Pretty cool. Um, um, okay, so hashtag Hawks. I will try to tailor it to the winner if it's within reason. If the winner's like, oh, I want to, can you send me a, a G Loomis Rudd? Then I'm just going to delete them and not answer their, their text or emails. Um, Tom, okay, fun question here. Uh, Debo and Dizzle, what rod would you pair with a Daiwa Tatula 150 for an all about combo? Man, you already know my answer, Tom. I bet you can already pick it. My answer would be like a seven foot ish. So seven foot two, or maybe a little bit shorter if you're short, like a shorter rod. For me, like a seven foot, medium heavy, moderate fast rod can do so much. And it really depends on how you fish. If you mainly fish finesse stuff, like quarter ounce, smaller stuff, like a medium. If you normally fish like three eighths ounce stuff, whether it's a Texas rig, spinner bait, chatter bait, whatever, I would go with a medium heavy. Because the, the nice thing about a, a medium heavy moderate fast is it's got enough tip. So meaning that when, when you talk about action, the faster an action is like an extra fast or a fast means it bends quicker toward the tip. So an extra fast is really just going to bend more toward the tip. Whereas when you talk about like a, a moderate or a slow rod, it's going to bend all the way down and make like a, a candy cane kind of shape to it. Bend way down toward the middle of it. I like that because you can play with more lures, I feel everybody's different. You ask five pros and you could, you probably get five different answers, but I think like a medium heavy, moderate fast, something with like a decently soft, we're going to come back um, to the giveaway here, but hashtag Hawks to get entered. Um, that's my pick. This will all let you go. Um, I'm trying to think of what my uh, lose tournament beats pool. Is that the, the uh, black and gray one. It's probably two, three years rod? old now. Yeah. The, well, the combo that I have, but that rod specifically, um, I think it met all of the categories that you were just talking about. It's a all around fantastic rod. Granted, it doesn't handle, you know, top water or like a jerk bait very well, like a walking bait and things like that. But overall, I would, I would use that almost everywhere. Yeah, that's my pick. But I would say, like, if <clears throat> if there's something you really, really fish the most, so that's another question I get is, like, should you spend more money on the rod or reel? My thing is, like, if there's a, a, a combo, like, if you have enough money for multiple combos and there's, like, a technique that you really like the most, like Dizzle, he's probably put a little bit more money into his jig rod, jig combo. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the rod. The rod's, like, $130 rod, but he's got his Corrado DC on there. It's, like, his favorite mm -hmm. reel. You know, so don't be afraid to put a little bit more um, money into your favorite combo. Like if you love fish and chatterbaits, get a chatterbait specific and and get your favorite, right? Or if you love Ned rigs, get like a really good, you know, bottom contact spinning rod and reel. Um, because I do think you you are more successful if you have more combos, and that's not a money grab. That's not some bullshit of you know you have to have more combos to go out. I fished with one combo forever, and my biggest mm -hmm. problem with that was whatever I had tied on, I was fishing it. Do or die. I didn't want to change lures 27 different times. If I had a spinnerbait on, I was fishing that thing all day, even though I had other stuff. Or when you, I started getting into didn't, more... you didn't have that time on water technically because you were right. changing out lures and things like that. Right. So like, and I'm not saying you have to have 10 different combos, but even like two or three different combos where you can have like a, a bottom combo, a top water combo and a middle combo, mm -hmm. like we talked about before, three columns of the water, even just having a few different combos with you as you go, I think you will be more successful when you can switch. So that's just me though. Oh, Paul's jumping off. Paul, thanks for hopping on and hanging out as long as you did. Appreciate you. We need to get you and uh, Burley on again another night. Um, let's see. Yeah. Brody kind of just pinned what I was saying here. I fish tournaments. Always, always, always fish fast for your limit. Then slow down. Yeah, exactly. You can't, it's, well, I can't, shouldn't say you can't. It's hard to beat a guy coming in with three fish, you know, when he's got five and you've only got three. So it can be done, mm -hmm. but you're just making it harder on yourself. Carol said she's out. Good night. Tight lines. Good night, Carol. Lots of people jumping out. 
Um, let's see here. Sorry, Tebow drop shot. Yep. Big Malone, what's up, my man? He does love the drop shot. That's okay. It's all right. Different different strokes for different folks. Um, Dizzle, let's answer this one. That's for you while we go back to our giveaway and pick a winner here. Um, okay. I don't like oh. uneven. We got to get to 110. Four more people have to hashtag Hawks. We have an enter. I'm not drawing a winner. We need at least 110. Or I'm not um, I actually, I did in chat. Um, there were two of them. It was the uh, Sixth Sense Divine. Um, I've really grown to love that uh, as a trailer, um, which again is a is a paddle tail, and a lot of people don't like paddle tails when it comes to uh, chatter baits. I don't have a big issue with it. Um, the other being probably my favorite would be the Jackal Rhythm Wave. That is just. It's an amazing, amazing soft plastic, in my opinion. Okay, we just hit 110. Um, if I missed your question, we'll do. We'll hang out here for a little bit. We've got 210 people on right now. End of the stream, we've got more people than the whole night. So winner is Everest, 1984. I did forget to say you must be present to win. If you're new to the streams, must be present to win. Um, Everest, are you here? Are you here? If you are up. Oh. Forgot to turn off my compressor. I was painting the other day for the first time in Jeez. months. Whoa. Oh, Hick whoa. Hickman Outdoors. Uh-oh. Somebody needs to get put in timeout, I Let's guess. Let's put him in timeout for at least uh, <laughs> yeah. a year. Everett, are you here? I still haven't seen your name. Hella. Just woke up from a couch nap. Dizzle anything tones me had, had any <laughs> Dizzle anything tones had me drifting off. He Everett does have a is here. Voice, doesn't he? I'm here. Okay, Everett, please send me an email to debosfishing at gmail.com. Let me know what you would like or what it would be uh, like centered around. If you've got a, like certain lure you like, if there's something you really need, you've not fished any of them, you don't have any of them. Let me know, Everest, 1984. God, there's nothing better than a fantastic couch nap that just comes out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, those things are amazing. Amazing. Oh, I'm back. Hmm? What, what happened? Sorry. I need to put my uh, headphones back in. Okay, Everest, hit me up. Let me know via the emails. Debosfishing at gmail.com. All right, chat. What do we got? Uh, what do we got for questions? I skipped over a couple there, I think, when I was scrolling through. What else we got? We'll hang up for a couple minutes. Um, even if it's for nothing more than putting you all to sleep with Dizzle's Soothing voice. Whoosh. You know, kind of like a uh, storm or something. I don't know. What's that over there? <laughs> uh, Gramp said, I can't type that. It doesn't work on my keyboard. Hey, how'd the, uh, how'd the Hoosiers do today? Did they play? Um, did they play? They play Michigan or Penn State. They played somebody and they, they got close to winning, I think, right? Let us know the score there, Gramps. <clears throat> yes. um, let's see. Any advice for a novice at Gunnersville? Man, I wish I could. Never fish Gunnersville. I do not get to travel and fish. Uh, Gramps, isn't Gramps going to Gunnersville? I think I saw a post from him. He did He's say, still in yeah. here. Uh, basketball season's coming. Yeah, I know. Hawks are going to have a deep team. I think uh, Fran said there's... 12 folks that he thinks he can play pretty confidently, but yeah, we're not going to have the stars this year. Still be fun. Love watching basketball. Doesn't have a football team go Irish. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Gramps is headed to Gunner Gunnersville on Monday. Good luck and mm. safe travels. Uh, Philip cheek made a great point at nine o'clock saying that jerk jerk bait fishing. Um, you got to have the right rod just about, any reel, you know, you can pair with it, but I will 100% agree right rod. And honestly, 
jerkbait fishing, you need the right line too. Um, you really want wow. something mono y? Just saying. USC's getting handled right now. That's, I wouldn't have guessed that one. Booze um, balls. Go sports. Let's see. We had two of them here. Brody, um, do you fish buzzbaits much in the fall? Absolutely. I've been destroying an Iowa with them. I, I feel like I may have. Oh, you're in Iowa, Brody. Brody Basson. Do I recognize that name? Do you paint baits? You've got like a, a swim bait there. Brody Basson. Why does that? What was your avatar before? I feel like you're one of those jerks that's changed your avatar. Who Brody are Bassin you? Sounds What's familiar. going on? Don't change your freaking avatars, people, because I know people by their avatars. Everybody um, change it to Frozen Debo from a few lives back. <laughs> I do throw buzz baits in the fall. I've only fished once in the past probably three weeks. I think today was the first time in two weeks for sure. Um, I feel like I probably missed that bite today. It was super duper cold. Maybe you crushed them today, but today it would have been a little bit cold for me, I think. Maybe you could have got on them, but yeah, absolutely. Fishing into the fall. And I tend to put top water away minus a walking bait. That's the one I keep, even if it's still cold and I have any sort of chance that I think I can catch them on a top water walking bait for me in the fall. But I mean, I know guys that have caught them on, on buzz baits down to the fifties, you know, down to 50 degrees. And I've heard of uh, jerks throwing like frogs this time of year and catching fish. That doesn't surprise me though. If we, if we were on a different type of body of water, I bet we could have. Yeah, Chris you, you, catching you some. Missed that. Yeah. No, I got it. Chris catching some mondos today and rubbing it in our face. Uh, Matt's fishing question: What do you think about Casey, the owner of Six Sense, threatening to sue people for not liking what they say about his products? I do. What? I think. Yeah, I think that was probably not true, but. Um, I don't know. I don't know the owner of Six Sense. I don't see why anybody would threaten to to sue for not liking what they say about his products. I don't know. I'd have to know more on that, but I don't know much about Six Sense. Mm -hmm. I know they make some really good stuff, um, but I don't know much about them. <laughs> A jerking rod. Yes, there are good jerking rods out there. And Philip, question, did you throw jerk baits much in the past? Because I feel like that's kind of new for you and you are like, all over the jerk baits last couple of years. Um, Debo, you should co angler for the bass tournament in lacrosse, dude. I don't know lacrosse. Mm. I would be a a shit teammate to have for that because I don't know much about the area. I'd love to. That's actually what I would like to do more than my dreams of like. I'm not a great angler. I will admit that. Like Milliken, light years ahead of me as an angler. You know, people watch you on YouTube and think, oh, this guy's great. I'm just a guy that fishes. Somebody like Milliken knows how to catch them, has proven it, has won. Like that dude is a beast at fishing. Um, I personally would rather, like Brody is saying, I would rather co-angler with um, people. Oh, you were Ty Carbide. That's why. I didn't recognize the name, but okay. Yeah, quit changing your stuff up, jerk. Um, you had the cat with Everybody like the Everybody change your right now. You had the cat with like the laser avatar. I know exactly who you are. I tell you, I know people by avatars. Um, I would much rather be a co-angler and learn from people who do stuff that I don't fish, like offshore electronics. Mm. As much as people hate it and as much as it's a controversy, the little that I've played with it, I think it's freaking awesome Like to be able to learn that and see the stuff. Now, I'm not a pro that makes my money fishing, and there's all sorts of people that I saw Punch put a thing out today that, what do you say? I was cracking up. Like, I didn't know about Randy Blockett, you know, last year or whatever. And I started, you know, people were, everybody's talking about, so I watched some of his stuff. He's a different dude. He has a different, um, you know, like, say on things. He doesn't have it on here, but Punch showed, shared, like, a thing that was, like, apparently BASS now installed people to track like the electronics game and monitor it to see if it's like, I don't remember how Unfair it was worded. Advantages like, or? Yeah. If it's like too overpowered, if it's mm. um, bad for viewership, but essentially like people to specifically look into that. I don't know if it's going to lead to mm. anything, um, but it's you know, like, Randy's uh... on the team of, he's on the team of like, I don't like electronics. I don't like live scope. I wouldn't necessarily, um, I, don't, do I wouldn't say I don't like them. Um, I just don't. It's too unknown to me. I need them to get off of my yard. 
Um, personally, that's how I feel. I, you, you, it's too, like I said, it's too unknown. I mean, if somebody really, really, really knows about it versus somebody that just is kind of proficient with it, I could see a very unfair advantage with it. With, and the other thing is know, we're not making our living using it. You know, yeah. that's the other thing is like, so I've been on the boat with Brando. I was on when I went up with Monster Bass um, with those guys looking at their live scope and Mega 360. I don't know what the hell. I, I can't even tell you all the names of this stuff, but um, I found it very interesting because you can see the spots. You can see the fish moving like the shadows, how they're reacting. Bass Geek, go watch Bass Geek. Um, you know, like he said, like it or hate it, you can learn from it. Yeah. You know, that's the big thing is he, you know, he was fishing topwaters and watching fish come up and react to his baits. Right. But again, none of us are making a living from using it. And is it a, is it a fair advantage? Just every single angler on the tour have it, you know, I'm not going to get into it. It's not my fight. I don't, I don't have any skin in, in the fight, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Wes. I, I uh, do just is, real quick before you go to that one. Yeah. Go uh, jumping back to the uh, co-angler thing. I don't know how me personally um i don't feel like i am built to be like a professional fisherman type of person i know i've fished in tournaments yeah, in the past either. nothing crazy but when i was fishing a lot of tournaments and by a lot i would say maybe 10 in a season but for me that's a lot i really started to not enjoy fishing there's just something built into me where 100%. I like to challenge myself, but at the same time, I, I put money down on the table. And, you know, if I'm getting my ass kicked by these guys that are obviously way better, have way better equipment, I'm just the back of the boat guy that doesn't have a lot of you control have to have, over anything. You have to have a very competitive mindset. It, Dude, it's just like any sport, like MMA. I did MMA for 13 years, and I could pick the guys that were going to be good like, I feel like I had that deal of like, you could tell the guys that had the mindset that had the grind that didn't give a shit about anything else outside of MMA, they would eat, breathe, sleep, poop it 24 seven. And those are the guys that are going to be, even if you're not that great, you're going to find your way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll have the, you know, we had guys that were so physically gifted and, you know, they had problems with, with running around to the bars and drinking. They had problems with like, you know, a lady. They had, you know, all this other stuff that got in their way. And there was the people that it didn't matter what was in their way. They were going to make it happen. And I feel like that's the same mindset you have to have with bass fishing that I'm going to grind it out. I'm going to, I'm ready to practice, you know, three days of fishing, you know, like mm -hmm. I fish a full day of fishing on my back is already like, oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing a, to I'm fish three days of fishing with having to drive across country myself, putting Gas yeah, you're, in you're my a part-time fisherman you're a full-time driver yeah right and, and all of this other stuff and like you said i mean i was saying earlier when i was talking about casting my shoulder is freaking destroyed from casting that a rig like yeah there's a lot of know how people can do that all day long there's a lot of multiples. internet trolls and like keyboard warriors that talk shit about that but it's like do you have to be like peak physical specimen to fish no but like there's a certain like What would I call it? Like there's there's a level durability. A level I would say durability yeah. to be a fisherman, like standing for 10 hours a day fishing. A lot of people aren't used to that, man. And it's not much. It's obviously not physically taxing on you. More so standing virtually <clears throat> still in one yeah. spot, not being like able to walk around and stuff. Yeah. That's a now, big thing. Is it like physically taxing compared to football or basketball? No, not even close, mm -hmm. but you know, I think a lot of people talk crap because they're jealous or, oh, it's easy. It's just like any sport. You know, MMA, you'd hear the guys out in the crowd, oh, quit hugging him, quit kissing him, fight. You know, they don't understand the intricacies of kick like, him in the nut. yeah, kick him in the nut. Like getting down on the ground, grappling, like one little false move and guys got you in a submission. You know, same with him with bass fishing is, man, you've got to be ready to drive, to grind, to stand in hotels and camping and. To yeah. go up to Michigan and fish right. the Great Lakes and maybe die. 40 foot clear water versus traveling to Texas and fishing Lake Fork to. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Lake Michigan, Great Lakes, giant rollers, swamped boats, <laughs> death, dying. Yeah, I want none of that. Um, Wes, this or that. Bigger pond that's pressured or smaller pond that's not pressured? 
How big are we talking for big and small? My idea of big and small might be a lot different than other people. But if I'm talking like a 15 acre small, quote unquote, small pond that's not pressured all day, I'll take that just for fun. I'm not trying to brag and say I'm a good fisherman because people that get good at fishing 10 acre ponds, I'm not trying to take anything away from them. But like when they start talking shit about like against other people of like, oh, I can catch them better than anybody. Big difference in fishing a place that's miles upon miles of shoreline versus a, a 10 acre pond. And it's not that you're not as good as them, but it's that everything's so condensed. You cut that time out. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got, if you've got 10 miles of shoreline to run across, where in there is that bike going to happen versus if you have a 10 acre lake, you can walk it in what an hour. And realistically, I mean, it doesn't, the the size of it doesn't necessarily matter. It's the pressure for me. I mean, I would rather take something that's not as pressured and have it be a tiny body of water where it doesn't necessarily matter just because it's a tiny body of water doesn't guarantee me any fishes. Right. We're going to eat my lures. You and know? that's the exact opposite. And yeah, people that say somebody commented on, I was on, I think Burley's on a live and that somebody said, Oh, Debo fishes ponds. His opinion doesn't count. He sucks or something like that. I'm like, fuck you. Like, yeah, I fish ponds, but just because mm-hmm. you fish a pond doesn't mean it's a guaranteed bite. Like, right. People, people are um, keyboard warriors and just kind of shrug that shit And off. you know, the other thing that I just can't stand is like 250 horsepower motors. That's not even fair. And you know, I'm, I'm not that fast to be able to get to my, I'm just messing with gramps right now. Just saying. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Hickman, I did only because I know you, I put my avatar. Yeah. Um, Hickman outdoors, which is kind of cool because you had the, you've done a few different changes because you had the brothers fishing and now outdoors. So you and Jeremy, I think it's cool. You and Jeremy do that. However you market it or, you know, switch your stuff, you know, to make it more cohesive either way, you and Jeremy doing that. Yeah. It is awesome. Getting him involved. And I feel like I know, I don't know him obviously clearly as well as you, but I've seen him come out of a shell quite a bit just from when I've started to now. And if Mm -hmm. even that little bit has helped him, that's what it's about, man. That's exactly what it's about. Um, Somebody had a good question here. Not necessarily a good question, but um, my custom Ned rigs hold up. Are you talking about the skirted ones? So the Ned jigs or the Ned rigs, the regular Ned rigs hold up great. um, As long as you bake them and do the powder paint. My, custom ned jigs which are the ones that i hand tie and put like a little skirt on i have noticed even super gluing and stuff some of them will come down the shank a little bit but once you put a plastic on there doesn't matter it keeps it held toward the top so again i'm not a pro i'm just kind of tinkering with all this stuff but i did notice that on a couple of those the skirt did try to slide down that little actually i've got some over here the ewg cap this will grab a question i'll take a drink um let's see let's see let's see you know the bigger thing that at the end of the day it's really um you know catching the fish being able to catch the fish being able to change stuff up i will say i did throw um some debo jigs today because for some reason i broke off all of my black and blue or darker colored um jigs i'll say that debo's jigs are nice but they snag just like any other jig <laughs> i don't know i don't have the uh, any of my ned jigs i thought i had one up there and i don't anyway it's one of these this is actually a tequila sunrise this is some of the ones that dizzle donated to the depths today anyway i tie like a little skirt on up here toward the lead part of the head it slides down this little flat part here this part but it doesn't actually come off the bend so once you put a plastic on it Brings mm-hmm. it back up toward the head. Um, I will say Brian. Oh, gosh, I'm going to butcher it. Um, Brian's custom tackle, I believe. Brian Boitano. What would Brian Boitano do if he were here today? He'd make a plan. He'd follow through. That's what Brian Boitano would do. That's from the original South Park movie. Anyway, um, Brian's custom tackle does like a fluorocarbon keeper on his, which makes it even better. And none of his have come apart, so. Maybe I need to uh, hit him up. Mm. He's great. If you guys are looking for ice fishing jigs, I made a huge order from him. Like my own money, he didn't need to. He threw in some extra Ned jigs and some ice fishing jigs for me. Super nice guy. Uh, 
if you're looking for ice fishing jigs, actually, let's go look at his because I like shining a spotlight on local folks. He's up in, I want to say, Michigan, maybe. Um, I'll show you guys here. Anyway, um, I first saw him for ice fishing jigs. And he does some of the other things, too. But super nice guy, threw extra stuff in for me, not knowing who I was or whatever. Um, and I always appreciate that when small folks do this. So I think he's in. Oh, yeah, you guys have seen him. Actually, I've got oh. one right here. I've showed this before. So he did also afterwards, I thanked him and sent him a thing. He sent me a Hawkeye inspired. This dude does some sick stuff. Kuda's had him on before. So this is, I think, rabbit fur, this part here. He makes his own jigs, Arky style jigs. But all in one does like a rabbit for a craw trailer, rubber jigs, like living rubber. So the not round frog parts, fur though. No, not frog fur. Living rubber with um rabbit fur. How freaking cool is that? Ended up sending me a hawkeye specific one. But um checking out his stuff here, he does like jigs. So these are the I don't know what he calls them. Um, Plum brown. Patrick did have a question while you're looking that up. Um, yeah, what is it? to know, will there be a review on the Daiwa Tatula 100? Absolutely. Dizzle and I filmed a little B-roll on it. Uh, looks like he sold out of most of these, but there's one actually dad remembered from the other day called Bullfrog. We were oh, both catching them on. I don't know if it's in his, in his lineup here. Does he have a nice Wonder Bread in there? Um, he does. I don't see it here, but he's got uh, a What's nice that one? bread. What's that one? Uh, way to go down. Um, fourth row next to the one, one single yellow. Nope. Go, Spider. Ooh. Look at it. Spider, but look at this. Spider they jig. glow in the dark. Spider jig. Spider, 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 spider. Go back. Dude, actually, I don't like that because it looks like a tick. Yeah. <laughs> go back. Or favor. Right next to that yellow one in the middle. What's the one to the left of that? Go down. Be the one single yellow one right now. Yeah, that one you're on right there. What's that one? Merino. Dan Merino. Dolphins oh. colors. Lace is out. Lace is out, Dan. Yeah, anyway, he does some cool Big stuff. Check him out. He, he, um. Does he show the EWG? He does the EWG Ned rig with the keeper. Um, not those. Stubby. Stubby's upstairs. Did you hear him? I it sounded like he was kicking the door at, down like <laughs> I, don't, I don't know his website here, but he used to do the EWG Ned. Maybe he doesn't do them anymore. Maybe they were. Perky. Hmm. Maybe you have to hit him up. Say that Debo sent you. Maybe he'll make you some specifically. But anyway, he does some really cool work. He does like a hair tying and all kinds of stuff. Dude's super creative. So um, let's see. What was the other question we had? Um, nope. Chris, I did reset tonight. So far, I've noticed that when I set, fingers crossed, when I reset before I go live, I don't freeze. So. Uh, so talking about rods, jerkbait rods. Mm. <laughs> It'd be awesome if you'd be going. Sorry for being a jerk. Yeah. Quit changing your damn avatar, people. Um, hey, Greg. We were actually just talking about Greg today. What line size do you guys use for finesse jigs? How um, light are you talking for finesse jigs? I've actually, um, I've started to downsize a little bit. I was a very, for my finesse jigs, I was a huge proponent for just 20 pound red box, you know, red label. Um, I'm really getting a little bit more comfortable. Um, yellow box, 17 pound uh, is where I'm at right now with any jig really. For finesse, if I'm talking like quarter to five sixteenth, I think twelve to fifteen pound is your best bet for feel and bulge. But I know, 
I know Dizzle's kind of view on, but your finesse jig is kind of like, there's two different deals. I, I feel like there's finesse right. weight versus finesse profile. Mm. Dizzle oftentimes throws a three eighths ounce finesse profile that he cuts down. Mm-hmm. So something similar to this, like a small ball head jig that's cut down. He would even cut this skirt shorter and mm-hmm. have a, like a really small finesse profile, but it's still three eighths ounce versus me throwing like a quarter ounce. Uh, I don't have any here, like a quarter ounce jig that I think does better on like 12, 14, 15 pounds. So Gramps with the 15 pound in Vizex. Can't go wrong with it. Um, Tom Brewster says, Debo, discount code for Tackle Oh Warehouse. my God. My guy T-Rock, I don't know if he's still in here. T-Rock is one of my work buddies. He actually told me the other day that he's like, dude, I actually subscribed to you and I'm a member. My man, talk about talk about making it big time when you got work buddies. Is that a members. sea turtle flying through the Milky Way? <laughs> I don't know what the hell that is. We used to play the Vigi games together back in the day. Not anymore. Both too damn busy with kids and such. But T Rock is a good cat. T Rock, thanks for jumping in and watching. Appreciate you, brother. Um, let's see. Gosh, I don't know what questions we're getting here now. It's mm-hmm. popping off here at the end. We must have uh, turtles and space. We must have poked space the barrel pants. a little bit. Yeah. Space um, pants. Debo Omni has though? the Revo S. Uh, yes, a long time ago. <laughs> With um, what's his name? Yeah, Theon um, or not Theon, but um, oh, I can't think of his name. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Height. I'm blanking. Um, height restricted. God, what's his name? Uh, he's a Lannister. Uh, Tyrion. Tyrion Lannister. Uh, Debo, Ami has the Revo S on sale for 110 bucks. Do you think it's a good deal? Uh, the new Revo X, I don't like. I'm sorry, Abu. I like Abu. I've liked their stuff. The new Revo X, I think, is a waste of money in that spot. Um, still a graphite frame reel. I think the Revo X or I'm sorry, Max X for 50 bucks is just as good as the Revo X. The Revo SX though, the new one, great reel. So the Revo S, I think the old ones were aluminum frame for 110 bucks. I think that'd be a really good deal. The old Revo X, so like the black one versus the Revo S, the only difference was it had the multi-adjusted brakes so it had the brakes on the spool i believe versus just the all magnetics on the old revo x the black one the new one though i can't get on board with it i've got one i picked one up didn't like it revo sx though you go a step up i don't have the new revo s i don't know if they made it let's look here um on the new gen what is that gen fives i think is the new release um fishing after dark five has a phenomenal question while you're looking that up um are you ready for this I hope you're sitting yep, down go ahead. is chili soup or stew um i'm always stew i don't love soups or really runny no is chili things. chili is that a soup or is that a stew stew to me it always needs to be a thick stew I don't like watery chili. It's not chili. But would you would you say chili in general as a chili's a stew? Oil? It should be thick. Oh if your chili's watery, God. it's not right. You've done it wrong. Um, I hate so here, I hate soupy soup. I want my yeah, soup to be thicker. But same chili is a soup. It's not a stew. chili's a stew. Chili's a stew. I don't believe that. Should be a bean meat thick tomatoy stew. I actually just made chili uh, a couple nights ago, and I just warmed up the crock pot again. I'm going to eat it again. Carl, so I think they um, skipped it. I think they skipped it, actually. So here's the new Revo X at $120. I'm sorry, Abu. I like Abu stuff, but I think that's a ripoff. The old, the old Revo X, which was a $99 reel, the old black one, had an aluminum frame. This one doesn't. Now you jump up to the Revo SX, which I really like. I think it's like 150 bucks now. Where is it? It's got an aluminum frame, cast really well. I think they did well on the new Revos. 
that's the Gen 4, yeah. So Gen 5 is the new one. I must have skipped it here. So, like, um, for we, example, oh, that's the B6. We all just got owned. Um, it is neither. Uh, Chili is chili. It's a stew. It's not a stew. It's chili. It's a stew. It's chili. Whoever typed that is wrong. It's a stew. I don't. I don't even see the. Am I blind? Am I stupid? What the? Oh, it's different colored. That's why. Holy! Oh no, that's the SS. We don't want the super shallow spool. Oh, what, yes. Oh. There should be a Revo mm -hmm. SX. How am I skipping? There it is. God, I've gone over. It. Oh wow. I mean, yeah, 169. Great reel. I really like it. Cast free aluminum frame. I like how they contoured this. If you palm your reel and put your thumb up here, super comfortable. Maybe a little more pricey than it should be, but I like the SX. I think it was a hit. Maybe just a little bit above price, but the Revo X, the new one, 120 bucks, not worth it. This one, I think, compares directly with the white one that Randy and I have, which is a great more budget reel mm -hmm. right the too. max pro at 89 bucks and look for sales you can get this for 60 bucks i do like those grips they have that little uh different feel or material i guess in the middle of that the grip rubbery, itself. yeah yep. and the ultimate i think one of the top two or three ultimate budget reels right now is the max x i've done reviews on it i've showed people it I got mine on sale tackle warehouse for like 35 bucks on Christmas sale. Hard to beat. Hard to beat. Okay. Let's see. Do we have any other questions here? We're uh, running on two hours. Let's see real quick. Um, having withdraw withdrawals, retired BC dude. I completely agree. It's been too long for me between as well. Some solid movie references tonight. Um, Debo plans for Saturday or Sunday. Next week, Dustin, let me know. I haven't got out in the purple machine yet. We wanted to make that happen earlier. Um, let me know if that's what you're talking about. Tom, I do have, I'm partnered up with Tackle Warehouse. I don't have a discount code for them. I didn't even put it in the chat today. Um, if you use my link, a, a portion of what you purchase comes back to me. But if you find it cheaper somewhere else, by all means, go there. I'm not trying to strong arm y'all into using Tackle Warehouse if you don't like it. Um, let's see. I think there was another question I saw jump up through here. <laughs> One ream of salt. Dude, peanut butter sandwich with your chili. I completely agree. Mm. It's delicious. Actually, you know, I'm Dude. I'm definitely in the minority here. You know what I like more? Cinnamon dipped. Man. No, I know people like that, and that's fine. I've tried it. Weird. You know what's what's kicking good is honey peanut butter Warm sandwich. Bread. Cornbread is awesome. I, that's how I normally have my chili always. Mm -hmm. um, you know what a, a honey peanut butter sandwich is better dipped in than chili? Mm. Chicken noodle soup. Dude, it's okay. so good. I mean, I can get if on board If you've never with tried it, chicken noodle soup with kind of a sweet honey peanut butter. Oh, my God. That's what we always ate it at school. We'd get honey butter because they would do like um, chicken noodle soup and then like cornbread. And you could have regular honey butter. We get that mm. honey butter on our on our peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a peanut butter sandwich. Oh, dip it in the chicken noodle soup. There's a uh, there's a so. restaurant, a little local restaurant here. It's called Peppers, I believe. I don't, don't know for certain, but they always gave you like with your salad, your side salad before your meal, one breadstick with one container of honey butter. That mm. stuff, I would I would stab somebody if they tried to take my honey butter, just to be honest. <laughs> All right. Well, so on that good. note, we're drawn to two hours. Dizzle's threatening to stab people over, over honey butter. We're getting out of here. Listen, we'll be back hopefully again next week. I don't know. They've been kind of hit and miss, but love y'all. Thank y'all for everybody that continues to support us. And until next live.